what is up my good people welcome back to my channel if this is your first time here then just welcome to my channel go ahead and hit the subscribe button because you will not be disappointed y'all know i was missing tuesday i'll tell y'all about that later on i ain't gonna put that at the beginning we can talk about it later because i got a couple things i want to talk to y'all about okay y'all i'm just gonna get right into it because we got a lot i gotta tell y'all about this sad strange little man harvey gladman and the thing is Lil harvey is mostly known as the glamour girl slayer but he's also commonly referred to as the lonely hearts killer but that title kind of belongs to martha beck and her man they were the lonely hearts killers and so we're gonna act like that's not a thing okay the fact that i just know that off the top of the dome is a little i don't know i feel a little weird about it i kind of side eye myself like girl why do you know that but i don't know her man name i can't remember so i ain't gonna give myself too much harvey gladman was born on october 10th 19 27 so he is a libra sis is a libra and so libras come forward and claim your brethren okay he was born in the bronx in new york but when he was just a toddler his family decided to up and move to denver colorado harvey was described as being a very very awkward very antisocial child he was also very good in school he had a very high iq and he excelled in pretty much all of his classes he also displayed an extreme interest in the arts very early on like he liked all things art and specifically photography like he really really admired a good old picture and a nice camera now he also displayed a few tendencies and behaviors that were a bit concerning because see just at 12 years old his parents started to notice these red like almost almost rash like marks around his neck they would also be swollen and they'd ask him like what happened where did you get that from but he would never have an answer it just remained a mystery like nobody ever knew why little harvey always had these these marks around his neck it wasn't until his mother miss ophelia walks in on him in the bathroom choking his chicken and choking himself at the same time he had a piece of rope tied around his neck and he was pulling it child and pulling on his little thing at the same time and she was mortified. She was like, sir, what are you doing? Like, what's going on here? Imagine walking in and seeing your kid do that. I can't. I'd be like, boy, if you don't get- When Ophelia questions him about why he would be doing something so strange and bizarre, he describes the feelings of sexual gratification and she was even more perplexed. She was like, son, this is not okay. While she knew that it was normal for young boys of his age to experiment, you know, test out his little nuts and bolts and their functions, she felt like this was, this was beyond that. Like this was a little strange. This was not normal at all. So she decides to take him to see the family doctor. And the family doctor pretty much tells her, oh no, it's fine. Like it's not that abnormal. He'll grow out of it. Like you know how boys are. They just... They're curious and pretty much sends them home. It's like, Miss Mamas, I need a prescription or something. Sophia wasn't completely comfortable with the answer or lack of answer, in my opinion, that she received from the doctor. But nevertheless, she just hoped that it was true that he would, in fact, grow out of it. So she takes him home and she's just like, let's see. Harvey goes on to high school. He attends Denver East and he decides that he is tired of being just this withdrawn recluse he wants to take some initiative to kind of get himself out there and be more social he decides that joining the band might be a good move for him so he joins the band he makes a conscious effort to participate engage more with his peers and make friends and they all appear to accept him and like him but behind his back they would mock him and make fun of his appearance and call him weasel they called him chipmunk due to his buck teeth and his big ears child he said he was just a funny looking little thing it didn't take long for him to catch wind of this and when he does his feelings are extremely hurt he decides you know what it's the best for me to just stay to myself and be how i was and he returns back to his old antisocial ways that wasn't the only way though that this negatively impacted him or affected him he began breaking into people's houses and stealing things and on one of these occasions he actually steals a gun that someone had had at their home and Lil Harvey was a whole creep because he wasn't just 
sneaking into people's windows in the middle of the night and taking things. He would specifically target these attractive, beautiful women. He would follow them home, enter their home via like an unlocked window or an unlocked door. And then he would just watch them, like watch them wind down from behind, I guess, like a, a closet door or something like that. And when he felt like he was comfortable enough to go out and attack, then he would just pop out on them. But girl, that ain't even the weirdest part of it. It's more. He eventually graduates from just taking things from their home to ambushing these women, tying them up with rope, and he would begin to fondle them and himself. He didn't full-blown force himself on these women. I just want to make that clear. Not that what he was doing was any, any less nasty. I'm just, just for clarification. It was so weird because this is the thing. Just seeing them tied up there looking all pretty and helpless and frightened was what got him off. Like that's what turned him on and that's pretty much what he was there for. So once he got that visual, he was able to just finish his little self off and go. May 18th, 1945, Harvey is now 18 years old. He's still in high school. He is called by police during one of these little break-ins. And when they catch him, he actually admits to them what he had been doing but only to the degree that he had been breaking into multiple homes and just stealing things. He didn't tell them about what else he was doing. Harvey's parents post his bail and literally within days, he goes and he abducts 17 year old Noreen who he knew from school. He takes her over to Sunshine Canyon and she's terrified. So, you know, that's right up his alley. He repeats his whole little act of, oh, you're frightened, you're afraid, I'm turned on, let me touch you and touch me too, like he does he does that to her and she is of course freaked out because he's weird. Once he finishes, he takes her back home, drops her off as if nothing happens and then he just goes on about his merry way. Noreen immediately goes and reports this incident to the police and she's able to make a positive identification when they provide her this mugshot book to see if it had been one of the usual suspects, I guess. Harvey is very quickly detained and he is sentenced to one year at Colorado State Prison for this act, but he is released after just eight months due to good behavior. Extremely concerned for her son, Ophelia decides to take him down to see a psychiatrist. She said, look, something is wrong with this boy. Y'all gonna have to tell me what it is. Like, don't just tell me he gonna grow out of it. Don't none of my friends, the 19 year olds, do these things. Somebody's gonna have to tell me something. This doctor tells Ophelia that it is his belief that Harvey is just afraid of girls. Like he likes women a lot, but he's afraid of them. And so if he could become comfortable with approaching them and you know socializing with them then this whole thing will blow over and it'll go away and he'll outgrow it he suggests that ophelia help him to find a new hobby one that would allow him to interact with women his personal suggestion dancing like sir who who gave you these certifications i just want to know who who gave you these certifications sir i just please let me know. Now, while Harvey was in prison, he had acquired himself some little TV repairman skills. And so Ophelia at this point is like, maybe you should just go back to New York. She finds him an apartment over in Yonkers. She sends him back up there, sets him up with a little nice place to live, helps him find a job as a TV repairman. And she's just like, let's just see. Let's just hope for the best, I guess. Well, was she just trying to get him the hell out of her house? I don't know. Nevertheless, whichever it was, that was the next move for them. Harvey acted all right for a couple of weeks but less than a month into him moving to yonkers he was back on the streets prowling for his next victim on august 17th of 1946 harvey takes a toy gun because he no longer of course had the one that he had stolen and he really didn't have access or money for another one whatever the reason was sis had a toy gun out there in those streets and so he sees this young couple walking down the street taking a late night stroll and he decides that they will be the ones harvey approaches them waving this little toy gun and of course they think it's real because it looks real so he is able to force them into a more secluded area when they get there he takes the rope and he ties up thomas and then he takes his little toy gun points it at doris and then he begins his little you know what he does by now he begins to fill on himself and fell on her at the same time. Now when his back is turned to Thomas, 
Thomas manages to wiggle free from the ropes, like get them from around his wrist. And then he lunges at Harvey, jumps on his back child. The two men began fighting back and forth and tussling until finally Harvey pulls out a pocket knife and he cuts Thomas. This pretty much, of course, forces Thomas to turn him loose, allowing Harvey to take off on foot. He just ran off from the scene of the crime, just on foot. He makes it to a nearby train station and gets on a train that's leaving that night headed to New Albany, New York. He gets there and decides, you know what, I'm just going to try to live here. But he could not fight these freaky little urges that he had within his little nasty soul. And so within a couple of days, he was back out on the streets prowling for his next opportunity. He spots this young woman who's a nurse and she's actually walking home from work after a long shift. He takes out his toy gun and he approaches her from behind. So he's holding the gun to her back and demanding that if she does not want to be hurt, she comply with all of his requests and he will gladly let her go after the fact. Now, at first, she is frightened. So, of course, she agrees to do so. But she's noticing while he is tying her up, his little hands are shaking. And he just as scared as she is, apparently. At this point, she decides to just take her chances and start screaming and drawing attention over to where he had taken her. And it actually works. He takes off on foot and just leaves her there halfway tied up and unharmed. And now with that being a fail and his little perversion still tingling within his little soul, he decides to go out the very next day and try again to satisfy his little, you know, freaky little urges. With his little toy gun, he approaches these two women who were out together. He started to feel like maybe he couldn't subdue them both. Like the last time he tried two people at a time, it didn't quite go his way. And maybe these two women are more than what he bargained for. So he decides the last minute to just burglarize them instead. He demands that they give him all of their money. And they both frightened hand over their bags to him. And then he just takes off on foot. But he was super disappointed in himself, child. He was kicking himself the whole way home. So he was not out for the money. That's not what... He set out to do and still his desires are unsatisfied. Harvey has one of the lowest confidence levels that I have studied so far because men, the men are typically very narcissistic. He was just a little slow and insecure. The women go to the police and they give a description of the attack itself and the assailant and it literally only takes them two days to find Lil Harvey and when they do at the time that he is located and apprehended he was actually physically in the process of pursuing his next target. He had been following this young lady down the street for quite some time but he was talking himself up to the moment that he felt the most confident to just go ahead and initiate attack but at the point in which the police find him he hadn't quite talked himself up to that point so they just go ahead and take him on down to the jail when they go through harvey's little pockets he actually had the rope the toy gun and also a pocket knife and he immediately confesses to being the one behind what happened to those two women at just 19 years old harvey is sentenced to five to ten years in prison during his incarceration harvey's evaluated by a prison psychiatrist to see if something is wrong with this because it just might be after all this psychiatrist does feel like something might be you know abnormal here and he says that he shows both signs of someone with psychopathic personality and schizophrenia. The doctor also notates that his sexually perverted impulses are the basis for his criminality. Now despite the doctor's very grim assessment and the fact that they really didn't make any attempts to rehabilitate him, it was just like, it's what I see and that was it. Regardless of the fact that this had not gotten any type of healing, he is released after just three years due to good behavior with all those issues. My thing is, there were no women in the prison that he had access to to victimize. Hell, aside from the crimes that he committed, he was on his best behavior in the outside world. Like, he did not have his victim of choice, nor did he have any of his tools, girl. Of course he was on his best behavior. Anyway, he is released into parental custody and returns to Denver because he has to move in with Miss Ophelia yet again. And I know she was sad, child. She just had to be. Miss Ophelia kept a close eye on her son. She was like, look, you can come back here, but not with any of your shenanigans. I will not tolerate it. So for the next five and a half years, he gets a job. He worked various jobs, actually, just here and there, everywhere. 
He checked in regularly with his parole officer just as he was supposed to and things were okay. He does not get into any kind of trouble. He's just doing what he's supposed to do and going home. In 1957 when his parole is up and he gets his full freedom back, he is now 30 years old. He decides he wants to move out of his mother's house and he wants to go to LA and just try to get a fresh start. But the problem is those psychopathic cravings that had not gone away, they had just been brewing and festering in the background. They reemerge, honey, and take on a life of their own. Now see, when he first gets there, he gets himself another nice little job as a TV repairman. He rents himself a nice little apartment on Melrose Avenue in the heart of LA. And he decides that it's time for him to revisit his love for the arts, photography specifically, but with a twist. Harvey sets up one of the rooms in the apartment as a dark room to use to process the photos that he takes. He also goes and buys himself a nice fancy little roller core camera, real expensive real bougie he also gets other little accessories that you need you know to have a little photography studio at the house and he is excited he just needs subjects to shoot he goes and joins like this sleazy little camera club where creeps like himself could come out and pose as photographers to take pictures of naked women who pose or harvey could have been the only creep i don't know but what i do know is that most of these young ladies that posed at these clubs, they were young women who aspired to be models or actresses. They just had come to LA to find stardom, like to be a star. Women who needed to earn a quick little buck, they would take these jobs posing down at these clubs for these men just to, you know, earn some quick cash, get some money, some food, live. Many of the young girls, because they were fairly new there and a lot of them were struggling, to make ends meet. They would oftentimes accept little odd jobs from these men who came to the club if they weren't anything too crazy. When Harvey takes notice that these women will exchange personal contact information and agree to do side work outside of the club, he decides he's gonna take advantage of this. Using the alias Johnny Glenn, Harvey approaches 19 year old Judy who was an aspiring model, one of the girls. He tells Judy that he works as a freelance photographer and he does work with a magazine and he would love to work with her for a shoot that he has coming up. He feels like she would be perfect for it. He tells her that the job pays $20 an hour and it should be a rather easy shoot. Nothing, nothing too crazy. Now this sounds really good to Judy who, like I said, is just 19 years old. And not only that, she is in the middle of a nasty little custody battle with her ex-husband over their 14 month old daughter. So she really, really needs the money for her court costs. Judy was looking to book as many things as she possibly could to help her out. He is able to sell her on this opportunity rather quickly. The two exchange information and he tells her that he'll be in touch. Now, a couple of days later, he reaches out to Judy to go over the details of the job. He lets her know that, you know, I got it cleared. You're the girl for the job. Here are all the details. And if you are more comfortable, then we can shoot right there in your own apartment. It's perfectly fine. He also tells her that for this particular shoot, he is willing to pay her an additional $30 an hour and that she can pretty much expect to make around $450 that day. She is extremely excited. So she gives him her address. He arrives at her apartment rather quickly, but when he gets there, he finds out that she does not live on her own. Instead of her being there by herself, she shares the apartment with two other models and they have a whole, you know, little roommate situation going on where they split costs. Now them not being alone really throws a monkey wrench in his little plan. And so he is trying not to panic and come off a little weird or, you know, suspicious or any of the things. He decides to just go ahead, set up and begin the shoot. So they get going and then all of a sudden he starts to complain. He's just like, oh, I can't get the lighting right. It's the apartment. Something about the way her apartment is and her lighting is set up with his lighting. It just won't work. Like they cannot do the shoot there. He offers for her to go back to his studio with him unless of course she is not comfortable with that and then he could just find another girl for the job it's it's really no problem now judy knew that at that rate he wouldn't have an issue finding another girl for the pro for the job and she really really needed the money so she decides to just go ahead and go over to his studio with him furthermore by this point he had really earned her trust a little bit because he was a small scrawny awkward little guy he didn't 
appear to be any kind of threat to her. He had not given her bad vibes or anything like that. So she really didn't feel like she had a reason not to trust him or to feel like he was being shady or something was something was up. To further seal the deal as far as her trusting him, he goes and gives his number to her roommate, Betty. And it's just like, hey, you know, here's my number if you guys need to find me. And so she's really feeling like, okay, well, if you know something goes wrong, at least Betty got his phone number. Betty can take it from there. She agrees to go with him and the two head over to his apartment or studio. It's really his apartment, girl. We know that. Now, when they get back to his apartment, he then tells Judy that he had not told her all the details of the shoot. One portion of the shoot includes photos of bondage. And for that, he would need to tie her up. He explains that she would need to be bound. She would need to be gagged and appear convincingly frightened as if she were about to be attacked. With him having earned her trust pretty much to this point and her not being really new to these strange requests sometimes, she's more than willing to do so. Like she does not think that it's odd. She allows Harvey to put rope around her wrists, around her legs, her mouth, as well as her ankles. And then he puts her in this little armchair and he tells her, you know, to wiggle around a little bit, look uncomfortable, look frightened, look afraid. And then the two begin the shoot. She is twisting in the chair with a look of horror on her face as Harvey is standing there taking pictures at different angles. He's giving her direction and it just looks like a regular old photo shoot. like nothing nothing weird going on then in an effort to evoke more emotion out of judy harvey takes out a gun a real one this time not the little toy one he even had this whole story he had a real gun today but judy does not know that the gun is real he instructs her to act as though she believed that it was actually a real weapon how afraid would you look if this were real? They get a few more frames in and then he begins to undo her bondage. At this point, Judy is just thinking, photo shoot over, I've done my work, I'm about to now be paid and go home. But just as quickly as the fake scenario had begun, child, it turned terribly real. He points the weapon at Judy and he informs her that as long as she does everything that he tells her to do, she will walk away from this completely unharmed. Now completely untied, he tells her to take off all of her clothes. And once she is completely naked, he begins to assault her. And it wasn't like before where he would touch himself and then touch her. He actually takes it all the way, losing his virginity at 30 years old this way. Up until that point, he had not had a full on adult exchange with anybody. It had just been him, his hands, his rope, in his imagination child. After Harvey finishes, he then forces her to sit next to him on the couch, cuddle with him and watch TV for hours. In an effort to save her own life and not really trigger him, she plays along with this. And so she endures for hours sitting there cuddling with this trifling little man. Although she had been playing along and did not show that she was bothered she was very much ready for him to take her back and it just be all over so when he tells her that it's getting late he's getting tired and he's now ready to let her go at 10 30 p.m she is ecstatic he tells her though he cannot take her back to the apartment that would be too risky for him to just drop her back off there and so instead he would need to leave her in the middle of nowhere but he would give her bus fare so that she can make it back into the city with no problem he ties judy up he takes her back out to the car and then he drives about a hundred miles southeast of LA to a desert area not deserted area a desert girl with the sand and snakes and stuff when he gets far enough out for his own satisfaction he drags her out of the car hog ties her wraps a piece of rope around her neck and just pulls until she stopped struggling then he takes out his camera that he had brought along for the ride takes more photos of the woman then he gets into his car and he just leaves her there hoping that the coyotes and the vultures don't leave much of her to be found meanwhile judy's roommates were growing suspicious at the fact that she had not returned yet and they hadn't heard from her now betty calls the number that harvey had left behind but it wasn't an actual number to anywhere, let alone his photography studio. When she realizes this, she immediately goes to the police to report the incident and try to get 
some kind of help locating her friend and roommate. The police respond by putting out a bulletin, hoping that somebody will come forward with some kind of information, maybe they would seen them somewhere, or could give any kind of tip that would lead to them finding Judy but literally nobody comes forward with any kind of information whatsoever. And what's really unfortunate is the fact that Judy was found months later. By this time, the animals had picked at her beyond recognition. So she went unidentified. After this incident, Harvey pretty much laid low for months. Seven months after this incident, Harvey is now ready to go out and claim his next victim, but he was too afraid to go back the same route and go, you know, back to the clubs. He just felt like it wouldn't have been a smart thing to do. I'm sure Judy's roommates knew that that's where she had met him, so of course he didn't want to do that. Instead, he is scouring the newspaper. There was a section called the Lonely Hearts Club where those looking for love could place them a little ad in the classifieds and possibly find it. He settles on a young divorced mother of two who had placed an ad and decides she will be the one that he pursues next. The two arrange to go out together and just see if there's some chemistry there and possibly a love of connection. When the time comes for them to go out, he picks her up and tells her that he's taking her out to dance and just to have a nice dinner after the fact. But soon after he begins driving, he tells Shirley that he has a headache all of a sudden and so he would rather just skip dancing and go straight to dinner. The two go to Oceanside. They have a nice dinner. After dinner, they go and sit in his car for a while. They're having conversation and just really enjoying each other's company. He then tells her how much he's enjoyed the night and and he was actually very sad that it now had to come to an end. Now this time when he begins to drive, she notices that um, he is not going in the right direction. This is not the direction that he needed to be going if he was going back to her house. He takes her out to a desert, forces her out of the car, ties her up, and then begins taking pictures of her. While he is taking photos of her, the bulb in his flash on the camera, it breaks. And so he is without a flash or any kind of light to help him take these photos. He is so committed to seeing this fantasy out to the end that he literally sits there and waits hours for sunrise to continue the photo shoot. It's the dedication and stupidity for me. Like, are you, are you, are you dumb? After getting more photos of her tied up, he then decides to change her bondage to where it's like she's hog tied and he proceeds to strangle her from there and take even more photos after the fact. He actually positions her in all these different ways, taking pictures of her in different poses and spends a lot of time out here with her doing this. When he's done, he decides to leave her there for the animals just as he had done with Judy. Now in July of 1958, young aspiring actress and model Ruth Mercado, she is just recently relocated from New York to LA. Ruth has big dreams of becoming a star and she is ready to work and hit the ground running. So she places an ad in the newspaper seeking any type of work that's like model, or actress related. Ruth is elated when photographer Frank Wilson reaches out to her almost immediately responding to the ad with a job that he has that he feels would be good for her. But first, he needed to see her portfolio to make sure she had the look that he was going for. And of course, she is extremely excited. She agrees to allow him to come over to her apartment so she can show him her portfolio and the work that she's previously done and they can talk about opportunities. He comes over to review her portfolio and he is impressed by what he sees. He feels like, yes, this is exactly the look that I was going for, like you have it. He leaves telling her that he is excited to work with her, that she can expect to hear from him very soon, within a matter of days. The very next night, he returns to Ruth's apartment, sneaks in, abducts her, and pretty much does the same thing that he had done to Judy and Shirley, including taking her out to the desert, taking the photos, and leaving her there. Now, this one, although the entire MO was pretty much the same as the previous two women, Later on, he told police that he actually really liked Ruth. Here's, here's the quote. She was the one I really liked, so I told her we were going out to a deserted spot where we wouldn't be bothered while I took more pictures. We drove out to the Escondido district and spent most of the day out on the desert. I took a lot more pictures and tried and tried to figure out a way to keep from killing her. 
but I couldn't come up with any answer. Child, you ain't like her enough if you couldn't talk yourself out of taking her life. I'm just saying. Don't love me like that. Now, but this time, Harvey had become a lot more confident in himself and the monster that he had been feeding within himself with his horrendous actions, child. It was pleased. His fantasies and his desires were satisfied he decides because this is pretty much working for him that this is going to be his official mo and there was no no reason to change anything like that would be his drop off spot these will be the tools and this will be the thing that we do that's what he decides this way of things was working for him he had a whole system that worked that is until he chooses the wrong victim lorraine vigil new to modeling 28 year old lorraine she is excited to find her very first paid photography job or modeling gig she had registered with several talent agencies and so she was excited when a photographer by the name of Frank Johnson reaches out to her and proposes that, you know, they work together, she is extremely excited because this is the moment that she's been working and waiting on. The two discuss potential employment opportunities and he arranges to come by and pick her up. She doesn't see anything wrong here until she notices that sis is going down the highway the wrong way for where they were supposed to be headed to. He was supposed to be taking her over to Hollywood, but they were going in the opposite direction of the little Hollywood sign child. I guess she could see it on her rearview mirror getting smaller and smaller instead of larger and larger. And she is like, oh no, baby, see something is not right. She's asking him, where are you going? What's going on here? He is not answering that question. He is not looking at her. He is pretending at this point that she don't even exist. He's just driving. When they pass the Anaheim exit on the freeway and his little speed begins to pick up, she really becomes concerned. She's like, um, excuse me, sir, where are you taking me? Like, maybe you didn't hear me ask the first time, but I need to know. So let me just try to ask again. Still no answer. He is beginning to drive faster and faster and still is not acknowledging her questioning. All of a sudden, he veers off the road, crossing two lanes of traffic, and then bringing the vehicle to a very sharp stop. When the car stops, all he says is that he has a flat tire. So you ain't gonna get out and act like you checked first? So I'm just confused. Like, how do you know? How am I supposed to be convinced? Now, at first, he pulls out some rope because he's going to try to tie her up. But sis fights him back. She's putting up a struggle. She is not going down without a fight. When he realizes that she might be a little more strong than I thought she was, he decides that he needs to get out his little gun. So he does so, and he points it at her. But instead of her backing down even now, she grabs the other end of it. And they begin to tussle back and forth. Suddenly, the gun goes off, grazing Lorraine's leg. Harvey's knee-jerk reaction in that moment was to release his grip from the gun, but she does not. Lorraine held onto that bitch and turned it on him. She gets out of the car, and then he gets out of the car too because he is still trying to get the upper hand here. But then sis turns it back on him, and she is just like, don't you fucking dare, you sad, strange ugly little man after preying on these women the way that he had he is now the one in the desert grass begging for his life you know what they say child ain't no fun when the rabbit got the gun now while all of this was going on a state patrolman who just so happened to be coming down that highway spots what he initially thought was a domestic dispute happening outside of a car alongside the road job between a man and his woman so he decides to go over there and check it out and you know de-escalate the thing like that's his mindset that's what he's thinking he's going in to do when he initially gets there and he sees lorraine holding holding harvey at gunpoint he thinking that lorraine is the one here that needs to be subdued but she quickly explains to him like look he tried to kidnap me i just gained the upper hand here some kind of way take him to jail please Harvey is arrested for this incident and taken down to Orange County Jail, but when he gets there, he very quickly and willingly confesses to everything else that he had done. He even tells the police where they can find the toolbox that he used to hold the hundreds of pictures that he had taken of these women that he had been victimizing and violating all this time. The photos have been perfectly processed in his little homemade dark room. The studio itself 
actually contained a lot of the belongings from a lot of these women as well so that was taken in as evidence he also agrees to take the investigators out to the locations where he had left the women but by the time that they got there many of the remains were scattered due to animal interference and so there was hardly enough of them left to do a positive identification when the details hit the news the media and the tabloids they dubbed him of course the glamour girl slayer and he of course received a lot of media attention his trial only lasted three days. He pled guilty. He begged for the death penalty. And the courts actually agreed that his crimes were so revolting and he was just so trifling that it was only one penalty that kind of fit the bill and that was the death penalty. It was a sentence that he accepted willingly. He even attempted to stop the automatic appeal that was granted to all inmates that were currently on death row in California. He was like, no, nah, don't reevaluate me. Like, leave mine intact please. September 18th, 1959, San Quentin State Prison just went on and tossed Miss Thing into the gas chamber, ending his life. And he was only 31 years old. Like, he was so young. And that's pretty much it for this story. I hope you like this look, though, because I do. I feel cute. Let me tell y'all where I was Tuesday. So, this is the thing. A lot of y'all, I love y'all. Y'all were so concerned. Like, y'all were writing me messages like, oh my God, I hope you didn't die. I'm praying for you. I'm like, girl, pray for my carpet. I ain't the one that need the prayers. Pray for my carpet. My, hey, Blue. My neighbors from hell upstairs flooded my apartment i still don't even know how because they claim to not have had a leak at all so i don't know what happened all i know is late late at night i'm hearing what sounds at first like rain i'm like dang i didn't know it was supposed to rain at night but i roll over and i'm just like you know i guess so i guess it did it's not like i watch the news shall i find things out in real time okay real time i don't never watch the news my mom used to say girl you the world is gonna end one day you ain't even gonna know you're gonna get up get ready for work open the door and that's when you're gonna find out and you know what i say to that baby i'm gonna politely get right back in bed when that happens anyway so i'm thinking oh it's raining but i'm like this rain sound real close like this rain sound like it's raining on me but i don't feel nothing but i'm just like it's just so loud i get my ass up cut on the light switch in my room and when i tell you every smoke detector and light fixture between like the entrance of my bedroom all down the hallway into the living room leaking not like trip 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 i'm talking about pouring water is pouring from them the light fixtures are full of water it's just a whole fucking rainforest in here and i was pissed so i'm putting down buckets to catch the water it's coming all down the walls like it was just a whole hot ass mess this is going on in the middle of the night it was nobody to call child so i waited till the morning i dumped the water and i called the office and i'm like hey i got a wet back I can get the water up and shampoo my carpet because I don't want to even have to wait on y'all because I just know it might start to stink. <sighs> I should have just let them call the professionals in because from there everything just went to hell, my girl. Tell me why. This is the thing about me. One odd fact about me and it's very weird and I know this but I really, really enjoy cleaning floors. It's really weird. I know. I like to vacuum. I like love to mop really love the vacuum and i like to shampoo carpet like it's a thing i'm weird I, I i get it i know i mean so really at this point i was like a mall cop i'm like bam i got action like i got this my mom bought me a bomb little carpet shampoo for like christmas or my birthday i don't remember which one it was but i'm like i'm gonna put this girl to use i got this part so they come out check everything else out meanwhile i didn't clean my whole carpet shampoo that girl is smelling so good I got the windows open. Now, mind you, the weather has been really ghetto. So it's been really cool and rainy lately. Cool and rainy. The bedroom dries up. Living room dries up. But the hallway is taking so long to dry because there are no vents in the hall. There are no windows in the hall. So the air is having to go a mighty long way to get over there to that piece of carpet. Even when I went to bed that night, it still was damp. And I'm just like hopefully by the morning it'll be fine so at this point i cut on the heat because i'm like the heat for sure i had a grill dry by the morning which was uncomfortable because i sleep in like 65 to 70 degrees in my apartment every night y'all why is my eye turning red it was something in my eye so now it's red just don't look at that one look at the other one this one is this one is out of commission right now where was i y'all in my sleep before i even open my my eyes 
because my nose is already open. So that girl had already picked up on the tea. I'm like, sour sock. You know how you put a load of clothes in the washer? You let them go, but you forget they're in there. And by the time you go back and look like a day or two later, it's like sour. Imagine your whole apartment smelling like that. The floor is still wet. I was pissed at this point. So long story short, I just had to rectify that. That's what I've been dealing with. And so dealing with that, trying to get that funk out, trying to get the carpet right, YouTube was not on my mind, y'all. I said, I'll see them girls Thursday. And I almost didn't see y'all today quiet as it's kept because I went about this. This is the, oh, what's that on it? Girl, I'm going to take you back to the store. I need to clean you up. Get that eyeliner off you so you can go back to the store. I went about this. The Urban Decay Eyeshadow Primer Potion Original. I used to use this all the time when it first came out many, many years ago. I mean, it, the formula could have changed a million times by now, but whatever. I trusted it because I used it before. And I was down to the last little squirts that I used today of the Anastasia one. And it was no more in store bars. And so I get this. My eyelid began to sting. It, it had a lot of redness. It was like a rash going on. And I went and tried to clean it, clean my little eyelid and rid it of whatever is in here that caused this reaction. But apparently that wasn't good enough because now it's still a little bit of, of roughness and uh, texture there. And it looked kind of scaly and ugly. So that also happened to me. Girl, I've just been going through. So I was like, I hate to do it. Like, I'm really ready to film and tell this story and talk to my girls and my guys about this. But if mama's eyelid is acting up, then I'm just going to have to let this have her moment. Because the last thing I want her to do is just, you know, decide she's going to leave. I need her. All right, y'all. My little eye is just really, it's really cutting up. Mama's is really doing a lot over here. So I'm going to end the video now. I love you guys so much. I'm glad to be back. Can't wait to... Oh, I hope she don't fall out. I can't wait to hear what you guys have to say. There go the eyelash, girl. It's gone. I love y'all so much, and I will see you in the next one. I'm about to go piece myself together. Peace. I don't know what reference that is. You are one sad, strange little man. This is the thing. See, the way me and my friend and uh, my sister set up, child, we spit out movie references, TV references, like that. So I forget sometimes where I got stuff from. It just, if it fits, I just throw it out there. But that title kind of belongs to Martha Beck and her man. They were the Lonely Heart, bleh. They were the Lonely Hearts killers. And so, call him Weasel. They called him, what else did they call him? Using a mugshot book that the police had provided her. I guess they was like, sis, is it any of the usuals? He tight, bleh. He decides that this is his, his best interest of in, bleh, bleh. What else they find? He had to roll the toy gun. You know what? Y'all know I like to take risks when I got nowhere to be. So let's do something. I got an idea. During his stint in prison, he is reviewed. What is the word? It's not reviewed. Reviewed actually work, but that's not the word for when a fucking doctor analyzes you. Evaluated. Signs of someone who went with the these little freaky little fantasies he had. They are the reason that he gets out here acting the way that he does. Like, baby, I could have told y'all that. During this time, he doesn't get into any... Yeah. In the heart of little old L.A. Allegedly, I ain't been, but that's what my research said. Harvey sets up a little... What is it called? I almost called it a black room. <laughs> I guess dark room is black. Ew. Technically, I'm right. Harvey sets up one of the apartments within the... One of the apartments within the apartment, girl. That's what you're going to. That's that's what you're going to say. The young ladies that okay, ugh. struggling financially. Financial. What is the word, girl? He tells Julie. No, her name is not Julie. This bitch better not pick my car. What was I? Nothing weird going on. Except beside the weird shit that was going on. What am I talking about? That is weird. He points the weapon at Julie. Who is Julie? So this is very much not. And he intent. He entails, I was about to say, entails and informed what is going on with me today. I felt like some of you guys could relate with that cuddling with this trifling little man. Ryan, just that part. All it discernment, I don't know. He drives about a hundred miles east of LA to a desert. Fuck me if that's not where the desert is. Where is my NARS concealer? I don't ever use that girl. On a nice little day, okay. What? When he is done, he decides that, okay, come on now. She had placed an ad in the newspaper. Okay, no, she didn't. Yes, she did. Damn it. Child and gut. <laughs> I shot all in my throat. 
The two of ratiate. What is ratiate? Negotiate a rate of pay. He comes over, he reviews her portfolio. No. He abducts her, takes her to, where he take her? He told police that he actually really, really, ugh. I'm the queen of slathering things on and just blend it out. I know you're probably worried, but don't be. Frank Lucas reaches out to her and he proposes, because Frank Lucas was a damn drug dealer. This is Frank Johnson. Frank Lucas, the fool. Preferably 65, 66, 60, 65, 66, is that right? Six, that don't sound right, six-ish, six-ish, what am I saying? Fuck it, 65 to 67-ish.